Almost every photographer that I've ever met has at one point or another tried macro photography, close-up photography. It might be of a flower or a bug or a butterfly or a small water droplet on the end of a leaf or a twig. It's the most amazing type of photography. But today's guest takes it to a new and smaller level. It's the art of the snowflake on this episode of Behind the Shot. <laughs> Hi again, welcome to another episode of Behind the Shot, the podcast where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots at the details from conception to completion and all those challenges that happen in between. As always, I'm your host, Steve Brazel, and today's guest is... I was just talking to him in the green room. He's 30% scientist, 30% photographer, and 30% geek. It's Don Komarechka. Don, how are you, man? Thank you so much for having me here, Steve. This is a fun uh, conversation we're about to have uh, because I'm in the thick of it right now. This is like you're pulling me out of the jungle for a conversation and then I'm diving right back in uh, because the subject is surrounding me constantly every day. And and I should mention we're recording this like four days before Christmas in, in 2017. So based on what we're going to talk about today, this is the height of your season, which people will understand better as we get going. Let's talk about you for a second. First of all, you're you're in Ontario, Canada. Uh, you're a nature macro and landscape photographer. So kind of all interrelated. But I like kind of where you go with your your photography. You're not when you say, you know, nature, you're not the type of nature I see a lot of photographers do. I mean, I think of you as macro mainly pollen. I mean, pollen macro photographers shoot bugs. They shoot butterflies. They shoot water droplets on the end of a twig. You shoot pollen. I, I do the other things too, but I like to consider much of my work, uh, what I call the unseen world. You know, the stuff that you can't see with your own eyes and the camera lets you explore infrared photography or water droplet refractions. Um, these are the kinds of things that become magical, especially because they are every day. They are around you. The, the universe at your feet is also what I refer to it as. Um, We've got award-winning gardens in my backyard. You know, I, I don't need to go on these illustrious trips to Iceland to get uh, wowing right. that's, photographs. That's a good point, actually. I would, I would like to, but I can do it right here at home. And that's, that's part of where the magic comes from. Well, and see, and there's that 30% scientist part, right? You're fascinated by, and everything I read about you and everything I've seen that you've written, you're kind of fascinated with that world that you can't see. It's a small world after all type thing. Um, you do infrared but what we're going to talk about today is the first way that I came to know about you. We were on an episode of of the original Twip show uh, together, and we got to talking then. And I've wanted to have you on since because snowflakes, everybody, as you have conversations about snow, we all say snow is beautiful and we understand the concept of a snowflake appearance. And everybody talks about how snowflakes, no two look alike. But most people have never seen one. And you actually photograph snowflakes. In fact, you're a published author. Uh, plug your book really quick. So Sky Crystals, you can get it from skycrystals.ca, is a 304-page book that details all of the science. So you want to know how they get that shape? Well, in layman's terms, you'll learn how, but also exactly how the pictures are taken. Every bit of equipment, camera setting, shooting technique, and post-processing technique is in that book. You literally so, in the book share your secrets on how you do this. Of course. I don't hold anything back. Uh, why would you in today's uh, photographic era? It's hard to do. So if you want to take the <laughs> walk down this path that I have, then you're 10 steps behind me. I've already moved forward. And all you'll do to me is inspire me to walk even faster. So I have no problem sharing all of my I secrets. love that attitude, man. You're, you're an educator, too. You do do workshops. But your workshops, I'm guessing, aren't on snowflake photography. What are the workshops on? It's really hard to time something for snowflakes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would love to, but I can't. Um, Hands-on workshops, I'll do uh, like water droplet refractions. So putting uh, an image inside of a water droplet by having it act like a lens and to okay. have a bunch of people sit down having never done that, maybe even never even attempted macro photography before and walk away with something that just wows them. It's a really rewarding experience for me. But um, I, I go all over. I was just in Whitehorse, Yukon, doing my Vision Beyond Seeing um, day-long seminar. And uh, so some hands-on, some hands-off all over the place. It's a lot of fun, though. I enjoy it. 
So let's talk about some of your accolades here because they're pretty extensive. Uh, Snowflake work was featured in the Canadian Science and Technology Museum. Uh, you worked on the B- with the BBC, I should say, to create the title footage for a documentary series they did called Forces of Nature. You, you were credited as a, as a macro photographer in the Discovery documentary Mosquito. Uh, you've also had contributions show up in various National Geographic things like the series One Strange Rock. And this is the one that got me. I love this. A 2017 limited edition one ounce pure silver $20 gold uh, silver coin produced by the Royal Canadian Mint. And it has your snowflake on it. It's got my snowflake and my initials on it. And uh, that that coin sold out. So you can't get that one anymore. But 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 I, I, I have to know. Presidents get their face on a coin, right? Very few artists get their their image on a stamp. All right. A twenty dollar silver coin, one ounce silver coin with Don Komarechka's image on it. When you first I'm guessing you've held one. What do you, what goes through your head? Uh, it was just um, a, a sense of walking to the end of a journey and just saying, OK, wow, I've accomplished this. But th- there's no there's no dead end. You know, you just keep going. And so I just sat and I looked at that coin for a while. And my wife was kind of getting annoyed because we were lying in bed after we had uh, arrived at the first shipment. And I just wouldn't stop looking at the thing. And I said, you know, I'm really happy with what I do. It is hard. <laughs> it is not easy uh, to do a lot of this stuff. But the rewards are there uh, when you get far enough down that road. And uh, because that coin sold out, there's another one. So if you do want one, Steve, uh, and they ship to the U.S., they, uh, they've they got a 2018 coin that has a bunch of my snowflakes on them. Three big ones and a bunch smaller that uh, uh, that really do the subject justice. Just it's so awesome to see. You've got to go for viewers. You've got to go online and look up photos of this thing because it is it is absolutely beautiful. You are also a podcaster, which explains that you have a, a road mic, a uh, 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 Heil mic in front of you. Uh, your podcast is Photo Geek Weekly. Explain to me what your podcast is. So I scour the Internet for the geekiest and nerdiest photography news of the day uh, or of the week. And uh, we talk about it. We go right under the hood with as much of that as we can. Uh, usually me and a co-pilot to bounce ideas off of. And uh, and that's always a rotating uh, guest spot. We just started. So uh, I just released uh, episode seven today. So we are uh, we're having a lot of fun. And uh, trying to be between a half hour and an hour length. Where, so it's where can they digestible. find it? Photogeekweekly.com. Okay, perfect. Makes it easy. So let's get into your photograph here because sure. I, I, I have literally been doing this. And for those that are listening in audio, you can't see I'm wringing my hands with questions for you that I wanted to ask you when we were recording TWIP with Frederick Van Johnson. And, and I just couldn't because it was a totally different show at that point. Is there... Do you name your your snowflake images? Because you've got a ton, ton of them. And in my head, I go, it's like a star. And so I picture this thing being named something like A3765-B. <laughs> you know, I haven't gone that route yet, but uh, I typically do a snowflake a day through the wintertime and I post them online. So on a yearly basis, they've got a number when I share them. Whenever I print them, I come up with uh, a more artistic name for that particular snowflake. So does this the one that we're going to talk about today have a name? I haven't printed it yet, so I don't think so. OK, I'm not going to show it yet. I'm not going to show it yet. I want to talk about snowflake photography first. Right. First of all, conceptually, how do you photograph from a camera point of view, a frozen object that's this small? Well, clearly you have to be outside, number one, because, uh, you know, anything, you breathe on the subject the wrong way and you melt it. There's so, no way you you have to be, you have to be outside. There's no way to, for example, take a bunch of snow into a really cold freezer room and do it there? Sure, but... I, anybody that owns like a giant meat locker that's big enough to walk into and do photographic experiments with, I, you know what? I, I don't have any of those people as friends. I don't know if I <laughs> want them necessarily as, uh, as friends, um, yeah. specifically for that purpose. So you got to work outside, but also logistically quickly. 
Um, a snowflake, as soon as it leaves the cloud that creates it, it starts to fade away. When there's lower humidity, it starts to evaporate. So it, even if it's not melting, the outer edges will start to fade off and kind of go in more towards the core. So by the time it hits the ground, it's still relatively intact. But 10 minutes later, it's going to be a shell of its former self. 10 minutes? You have to get literally freshly fallen snow. You've got to be out there when the snow is falling. And, you know, sometimes if really good snow has just fallen, uh, when it's nestled into other snow on the ground, it'll survive maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes. But you'll have noticeable signs of it fading away uh, within a half an hour. And so if you if you wake up and you see these glistening snowflakes all over the place, you're too late. I mean, what, they're what? there, but they're not going to be what you want. So what do you use gear wise? I mean, again, you can't see them with your eye and a normal macro lens at a one to one, you know, type view is not going to do it. So how do you how do you magnify these enough to get enough detail to make the beautiful art out of it? Well, first of all, is finding one uh, in order to then, you know, uh, get in close on it. And um, so the, the piece of gear that w has been pivotal to the success in this uh, process is a homemade black mitten uh, made by my grandma. And so that is the backdrop behind every single one of my snowflakes. I, that was one of my questions was, why is it always black? Yeah, well, number one was for contrast initially, because photographing white snow on a white background really didn't uh, connect with me. It was the subject didn't stand out. Uh, but the mitten, the fibers will lift the snowflake away from the background. And at these magnifications, your depth of field is so shallow then it makes most of the background out of focus and it makes the editing process very easy uh, to to get rid of that. But, but uh, it's also lifting it by only one or two points of contact. So it acts as an insulator as well as a mitten should and prevents it from melting if I'm near the freezing point. So I'm going to bring this thing up so that people can see the shot that we're talking about, you know, snowflake A17, 56, whatever. <laughs> um, and as you look at this, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious and before actually, before I bring it up, you have the camera that you use with you, right? I do. I do. Let, so, let me see the gear that you're actually using. We'll bring it up actually in a second here. All right. So this is this is my standard configuration. Um, <laughs> so that's a macro ring so, light. So this is it's got a ring light. That's how they're all lit on the front. And that's attached to the Canon MPE 65 millimeter macro lens. Uh, which gets me from one to one to five to one magnification. So that gets me five times closer than the average macro lens does right off the uh, uh, off the bat. Followed up a little bit further down is some extension tubes, and that a will lot push of it extension to, tubes. Uh, well, three. So it's a three set, but there's another piece beyond it. Uh, that'll push me into six to one magnification. It gives me one extra one, and then right at the uh, at the end here, this is the Canon life-size converter EF, which functions like a teleconverter for macro photography. In fact, any teleconverter would work here, and that doubles it. So that puts me from uh, 6 to 1 to 12 to 1 uh, within this configuration. Now, I don't always use it at that higher magnification because the uh, MPE is adjustable. If I bring that all the way down to its 1 to 1, then that goes 1 to 2 to 4. So 4 to 12 uh, in in the kit. Okay, so then hold on, because now I'm sitting here trying to picture the logistics of this, right? So you're, you've got the snow in your mitt. We've, we've clarified that the snow is on, on the mitten. Is your hand in the mitten? No, my hand is not on the mitten. Okay, because no, I'm trying to picture you holding your hand in front of the lens. <laughs> oh, that would be comical. Uh, and and doing, doing one of these to try and snap the picture. I, I wish I had that ability, but no, it, it's uh, it's just lying on a, on a on a table. And when it gets too cluttered with snow, I just pick it up and shake it off and put it back down. Um, but uh, I hunt around and I find an interesting snowflake. And then I take a small artist's paintbrush and I might clear it off if there's any clutter on top of it or get it onto a proper angle. And then a key part of the equation is I take that brush and I lay it down on the mitten pointing towards the snowflake. Because at these magnifications... If you don't know exactly where your subject is, I, I guess the proper analogy would be, you know, if you've got a super telephoto lens and you've got like a, a, a bat or a very erratic bird fluttering around in a cloudless blue sky, how do you find it? There's no frame of reference. If you hold up the camera to the sky, all you see is blue. Where's the bird going to be? Well, and, and uh, like for me, I shoot a focal sometimes the moon. 
So this telescope that's behind me, I'll attach my camera to that. And at that magnification, if I put an eyepiece in as well, just finding the moon can be hard. So what I what I use the brush for is I have to find the brush. And then I just use that as a guiding line. And I know that the snowflake is sitting at the end of it. Um, and so it's much easier to scan around arbitrarily and find this, you know, big wooden thing uh, and then follow it to the tip. And uh, the snowflake is, uh, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You had another lens there that you told me about. What's the what's the second one before I bring up the, <laughs> so, the flake? So snowflakes are small and uh, <laughs> the the 12 to 1 magnification gets me pretty close to them. Um, but sometimes they're sub one millimeter in diameter. Uh, I did one the other day that was a half a millimeter across. And even at that magnification, it's going to fill, I don't know, 20% of my frame, less than that. Uh, so you can adapt a microscope objective, which I've done here. So this is a 20x Michitoyo uh, microscope objective that is attached to my Canon uh, 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And that's just because this has a 200 millimeter focal length somewhere in the middle, uh, which this lens requires. Now, I built this little contraption here that has an iris on it if I needed to use it um, to stop wow. the lens down uh, uh, at all. But um, that you don't need to have. Uh, it's only if you want to compromise your resolution to add a little bit more depth. I typically shoot this thing wide open. Uh, and this little um, sheath on the outside of it has a mount for a ring flash. So I can just take my ring flash and stick it on the front of this guy. Uh, and I, then, I take back uh, what I said about 30% scientist. You're way, <laughs> way, you're like 100% scientist, 100% geek, and 100% photographer because, yeah, what you're talking about is not easy. So now, I want to talk about detail on this individual shot, but I'm still confused by just some of the process, right? So this has six branches, for lack of a better phrase. Mm-hmm. That's normal? Yeah, well, uh, a snowflake, um, okay, this is like my total science propeller hat going on here, but um, the way that uh, water molecules bond together create hexagonal bonds. And so snowflakes always start off uh, when you can observe them as tiny little hexagons. And uh, they'll always have uh, 60 degree edges. And so when you look at a larger snowflake, that uh, molecular structure echoes into everything else. If you were to measure the angles on the snowflake, they would all be uh, 60 degrees, uh, give or take the angle of my camera on them. And so because of that, a small little hexagonal snowflake starts with six corners. And in snowflake growth, the common logic is whatever sticks out the farthest grows the fastest uh, because it has more access to whatever the surrounding water vapor is. So at a certain point, each of those corners grows a branch. And that's why a snowflake will always have six branches, one growing out of each corner of uh, sometimes a very, very small hexagon, so small in the middle you can't even see it. Uh, this one, of course, is a little bit different. Okay, so this is totally off subject now. <laughs> Did you know that before you got into photographing snowflakes? It's it's the chicken and the egg thing, right? Were, were you aware of all of this science of the snowflake and that made you want to go photograph them? Or... Were you going, hey, you know what? It'd be really cool to photograph a snowflake. And as you did it, you ended up learning more about the, the science behind it. As I took a few photographs of snowflakes, the very first time that I was out shooting, I I was smitten by them. I mean, it was just, I, I was in love with the detail. And I've always been one to want to figure things out, to understand exactly why that happens to be the way that it is. And so from taking those images and I see something unusual in the snowflake, I, I buy books, I talk to scientists, I, I figure out exactly what happens to create this effect. And in fact, sometimes the discoveries that I've made have confused even the, the brightest scientists in the field uh, that haven't been able to give me a straight answer about it. And that makes me feel pretty good, too. Oh, yeah, that would, I, I can see that for sure. So here, here's a question, because in looking through your catalog of, of snowflakes, right, Sky, skycrystals.ca, in looking through those, obviously, these are small. This one is flat that we're looking at. Some of them are at a slight angle. And I'm wondering when you grab a bunch of snow. OK, it's fine that they're still in shape, but they're together. How do you get one snowflake separated from the cluster of snowflakes that it fell with without breaking or damaging it? Right. Well, and how do you get you do it flat? Uh, well, here's there's a bit of a misconception here is none of them are shot flat. Not one of them. 
Everyone is shot on an angle for one very specific reason. I'm using reflected light, and I am getting what amounts to glare off of a window reflecting off the surface of the snowflake. Oh. So if I had it flat to the camera, the light source would have to be coming from inside the lens, and that's not practical. So uh, there's some laboratory gear that can do that, but it's nothing that you can uh, take out and, and shoot snowflakes with. So in that sense, I have to shoot the snowflake on a slight angle so that if the snowflake is on an angle, the light's on an angle, it bounces up into the camera and I get that nice glare. You're doing but Rembrandt the- lighting on a snowflake. Well, kind of. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting glare. I, you just right. you need the glare in order to reveal all of the surface detail. Uh, and in doing so, it means my depth of field is so poor. Like it is um, each of these images uh, that you're looking at as a final finished piece on average contains about 40 different slices of focus. So uh, so you're focus stacking. Focus stacking is required to get it all in when I'm trying to get this reflected surface. If I had it flat to the camera, I can shine light behind it and and I can get it all in one shot. And that's the way it's been done for well over a century. People have been photographing snowflakes for a long time. Um, and in my research, there was a guy in Japan, I forget his name right now, a scientist, published a book in the 1950s. And right near the beginning, there was a part of it that said, you know, we tried to do reflected light photography of snowflakes. It was a failure in every possible way. So we just abandoned that entirely. And I've been encountering a lot of that mentality, uh, you know, as I've been progressing within my work. People are saying, no, you can't do that. Well, actually, here, I've already done it before I started asking you these questions. So, you know, <laughs> let's take it forward. Well, and I've never done focus stacking. So I guess my question is, as you're looking, what, first of all, what's your exposure on something like this? So you're going to be at your fastest flash sync speed, so one two fiftieth of a second for me. Um, and uh, my ISO is usually around ISO 200. Sometimes I bump it up to 400 just so that my flash can recycle fast enough, uh, but for no other reason than that. Um, but the aperture is where things get a little tricky because I might dial, uh, like on, on this image that we're looking at, the aperture was set to uh, f2.8, but it wasn't actually shot at f2.8 because as you add magnification to your, uh, to your optical equation, your effective aperture becomes a little bit different. The simplest equation would be for every magnification factor you have, you add one stop. You know, we don't deal with equations a lot in photography these days, but that's a pretty simple one. If I'm at one to one and I'm at f16, well, I'm actually shooting at f22. Uh, simple stuff. So if I'm at f2.8 and this image was taken at around, you know, uh, six to one magnification or eight to one magnification, then I would add six or eight stops to that. Um, At my smallest, at 12 to one, I'd be shooting at F 180. So then in theory, you've got a a, a more depth of field, but at this magnification, that more depth of field is still microscopic. So how do you, and again, this is, I've never done focus stacking. I'm aware of it. I have friends who do it. I've never done it. Are you looking through the camera and manually, almost like doing a pano, I'm going to do this section, I'm going to do this section and overlap, I'm going to do this section. Is that how you're doing the focus stacking visually? So it, not exactly. It's it's uh, a depth in one direction. So it's a, it's a, a linear motion of the camera forward and backward, uh, passing through the subject. You're not moving the zoom of the lens in and out. You're moving the camera forward and back on a macro rail? Uh, no, I do this all handheld. You are totally kidding me. I'm not kidding you. That's the only way to do this, because to find the angle that gives you that nice glare and surface reflection, you have to move the camera around the subject as the center of rotation, not the camera moving based on wherever it's mounted onto a tripod. So because time is definitely of the essence, and I don't want to wait a minute in order to get the shot, I find the snowflake, find the right angle, and I shoot my linear series uh, passing through the snowflake, um, from front to back. And, uh, I, as I said, I might use an average of 40 shots, but I don't know if that's how many I need for a particular snowflake. And if I take 40, I don't know if I got the right 40. So I drastically overshoot. I do one pass through and then I get about 80% of it. But the odds of you staying on the right axis, the odds of you staying on the right plane as you move in and out. It's easier than you think. My, my left hand is gripping the end of the ring flash and 
based on the, the focusing distances, that hand is also resting on the surface that the mitten is on. So my hand functions fairly well as an anchor, but it is no tripod. Wow. Okay, so now let's get into color. They're all seemingly black and white, but many of these that you have on your site, skycrystals.ca, many of these that you have on your site have a color tinge in portions of them. Is that natural? Is that based on reflective light because of the surroundings? It's it's 100% natural, uh, and it's based on a phenomenon called thin film interference that we see all the time. It's what puts a rainbow in a soap bubble or an oil spot. Uh, I've even seen it in Turkish coffee uh, bubbles at, at the top of the coffee. And uh, so what happens is a snowflake does not grow as a static, thick object. There's often bubbles and cavities inside of it. And so if uh, if you could imagine looking at the thin edge of a snowflake, the logic from earlier that a uh, whatever sticks out the farthest grows the fastest, which means the top and bottom edge or uh, the outer edges of any uh, crystal facet are going to grow faster than the inner part in the middle of it. So you get these little cavities, these little caves that start to grow in the thin edge of a snowflake. And based on the thickness of that, it makes the ice on either side of it very, very thin within certain tolerances. So... You could imagine uh, light hitting the surface of the snowflake bouncing right off to the camera. But some of the light will pass into the snowflake. In the uh, the ice itself, ice is a different density than air, so the, uh, the, uh, the light will slow down ever so slightly. Bounce off of the inner bubble area, because that's another reflective boundary, and then back out. Now, if that was thin enough, you have two, uh, two beams of light that are so close together that they can interfere with each other because now they're out of sync. And so when they're out of sync, that white light will turn into, well, whatever color that interference pattern tends to create. It's almost so a some, prism effect. Uh, a prism will be splitting one source of light. This is recombining two different sources okay. of light. Um, you can see prism effects in snowflakes too, uh, and that's a different story. You'll see rainbows running down the branches in some cases. Uh, but in this case, you can get these vibrant, uh, most common magentas and green colors that will exist within a snowflake uh, or because of the properties of the snowflake and, uh, and the angle that the light is hitting it. We, we lost one question that I had asked, and I know somebody's going to hit me up and go, you asked the question and you never, you never waited for the answer. <laughs> How do you separate them? So, you oh, know, uh, with, I think with, of with, snow on the ground as you're not, you, there's no way for me to just pick up one. I pick up snow, right? So how do you pick up the snow and manually pull out, extract one flake? Uh, with that same very small, very fine artist's paintbrush. And oftentimes you'll break snowflakes in the process, especially the larger ones becoming more fragile overall. Um, you're sweeping but, them apart from each other, basically. You're kind of sweeping them apart. A lot of times they will fall as a single snowflake, so you don't have to, to deal with that. But um, uh, if you've missed the fresh snowfall and you're trying to get, uh, you, know, you know, kind of dumpster diving for snowflakes, you know, the, the good stuff is gone, but it's still resting on the surface of the snow, mm -hmm. the mitten acts like Velcro. And if I just take it and gently lay it down on the snow and pick it up and turn it over, then I've got all of what freshly fell that didn't fall on the mitten. And then I can use the brush to uh, isolate and find one good one from that set. I, I have to say, photographing you doing this would be a fascinating thing, right? I mean, just your process in this is documentary information right there. Um, I, I cannot confirm or deny that that might be happening. Oh, I mean, I'm serious. I would watch that in an instant. This is fascinating to me. But now you get your photograph. You've got 40 images that you need to stack. You well, no, I've like, like I said, or however I many, right, the right or however many so you, you decide you need. I shoot between two and 300 photographs of the snowflake. Because if I get 80% on the first pass, and that's 40 there, and then I might get, you know, a remainder on the next pass, and that's, I'm up a about to about 80, maybe 100 images at that point. Um, and then I'll do that again. So then I push to around a, a, you know 200 photographs because there have been times where I've gotten the most beautiful, pristine example of a snowflake and I'm missing one slice of focus. So there's this blurry diagonal line running right through the center of that snowflake. 
and there is no worse frustration. I'm not one to swear, but there are words that are said uh, yeah. <laughs> in those moments. Canadian words. They're all safe. They're Canadian words. It, exactly. So at that point, I realized, let's just drastically overshoot and deal with it in post and find the, the pieces that you need. When I'm doing the focus stacking and putting them together, I use Photoshop. The order of those uh, the focus slices don't matter. So if I pull them from a little bit later, well, you know, I, Photoshop figures out exactly where they're all going to go. Uh, and in Photoshop, it's mostly an automated process uh, to get, again, about 70 to 80 percent of the way to completion for the photograph. Um, under the edit menu, there's auto align layers and then there's auto blend layers. And the auto blend layers has a panorama mode, but it also has a stacking mode. And uh, the automatic algorithms in Photoshop are, to me, the most forgiving. Uh, there's other software out there to do this sort of stuff. Uh, and if anybody's clamoring, hey, why aren't you mentioning this or that? Well, it's because Photoshop is better at fixing my handhold errors uh, because I might not just be moving left and right. There might be some rotational movements. Um, and Photoshop, in its ability to align things, is much more forgiving and, and it can align things much better. So um, I use that and I come up with something that gets me close to where I want to be. The background is often not completely clean and I've got to clean that up in post. Um, but because there was some perspective shifts, snowflakes are all about lines, right? They're all perfectly straight lines that connect to other straight lines. Uh, at angles. But if my perspective was off, those straight lines from one shot to another, once they're realigned, might be off right. just a little bit. And so the post-processing workflow that I have to go through to uh, to go through every single layer and manually paint in fixes, it's about a four-hour process per image. So taking snowflakes out of this for a second, if somebody just wanted to go, okay, well, just the concept of macro photography interests me and I want to get better at it, not necessarily microscopic macro photography, but you're one of the best I've ever seen at just what most people would consider you know, normal macro photography, as it were. What's your one single tip to give people on getting better macro shots? Change your background. Do something to manipulate and control the background of your subject. You don't do this for landscape photography because oftentimes the background is your subject. Um, but in the case of the snowflakes, of course, it's a black mitten. But if I take a color that's complementary to a flower that I want to photograph and stick that in behind it, whether it's like a, a nice dark blue or a vivid red or what, just as a background color, then you get rid of the, the, the drab, you know, kind of yellowy green background that a lot of macro photography has. And as soon as you make that change and feel empowered to say, yeah, the background can be anything I want, you can even take a photograph, print it, and stick that in behind a flower and photograph it out of focus as a background, uh, completely replacing it with a different scene. Um, yeah, that might be pushing it for some people, but taking one flower and putting it behind another one and photographing the foreground one when a bee comes in and lands on it, especially when you've got different colors, that is where magic happens. It's also how you deal with water droplet refraction photography, which I've done a lot of, uh, where a flower is placed specifically in the background and you choose the colors of that flower, which then become the background and the entire palette of color for the whole image. So if you're just walking up to a scene, opportunistically taking a picture, it might be a good shot. There's no question. But you want to make it a great shot? Think about how you can change what's behind the subject and it will just all gel together for you. See, this is interesting because uh, there's this theme that seems to run through all the episodes of, of Behind the Shot. And I mentioned I did, I'm doing a year-end retrospective for, for 2017 of the first year that I've done the podcast. And as I looked back through all the episodes, I find this thing and you think of it in normal like travel photography or portrait photography or whatever. And that is don't take a shot, make a shot. And that's really what you just described at the macro level. Yes, walk up to a beautiful bug or a beautiful flower or a beautiful bee on a flower and photograph it. But if you want it to be better, make the shot. Don't just take the shot and it changes everything. Lifts it to the next level, as it were. Well, and it becomes you as a photographer, as an artist, more than just a camera technician at that point. As soon as you start to to understand that your control over the subject and over the scene at, at large is what's going to make the photograph better. And it's not what camera lens you're using. Uh, it's not what camera body has the you know, higher megapixels or you know, the better ISO performance. It's what you as the photographer, immaterial to the camera, are doing to improve the shot. And that's what makes you an artist. So if people want to connect with Don Komarechka, 
Uh, what is you have two portfolios. You have the portfolio for the snowflakes, which the website again is skycrystals.ca. OK. Sky. And your normal full portfolio that has all types of the work that you do is my my anything but normal portfolio uh, is at doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M dot C-A. And that's okay. where you'll find everything from infrared and ultraviolet to uh, freezing soap bubbles and, uh, you know, water droplets and waterfalls and all the that other soap wonderful bubble things. shot that you showed me. And it's going to be in the gallery that I'm going to put on the blog post with this episode at thisweekinphoto.com blows me away. Absolutely amazing. You're on all the social medias. You're on Facebook and Instagram as Doncom Photo. You're on Twitter and Flickr as Doncom. And then at the doncom.ca, people can find your workshops link there. And all the links will be in the blog post too at thisweekinphoto.com. But again, and I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again, what you do, sir, is absolutely amazing, phenomenal work. It, it Looking at your stuff is a joy. You cannot not smile and look at your work. Wow. Thank you. I, geez, put me on a pedestal. Why don't you? I will do that. I will do that every day to everybody that will listen to me. Uh, Don, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Thank you, Steve. This has been great. All right. Again, this is another episode of Behind the Shot where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers like Don Komarechka to get a better understanding of the choices that they make and how they create the art that they create. We've got great episodes coming up this year. My name, as I say, is Steve Brazel. I'll always be your host here, and I hope to see you back next time. Thanks and have a great day. Hey there, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. Thanks for checking out the TWIP Network on YouTube. If you'd like to keep up to date with the shows we're putting out, be sure to click subscribe. And while you're at it, give us a thumbs up. You can also subscribe on thisweekinphoto.com where you'll find lots of other great photography shows. Thanks for watching the TWIP Network on YouTube.